Wednesday night before Lisa sang, she made the comment that uh, we have gone through storms, we are going through a storm, or we will go through a storm. This morning, while I listened to Adrian Rogers on TV, his message was entitled, Going Through a Storm. And he took his text from Acts where Paul was shipwrecked. Later this morning, there was a young woman who sang a song, and she said her husband wrote that song after they had gone through the storm of losing a child. My storm showed up Tuesday afternoon in the eye clinic at the VA hospital. In Mark, chapter 4, beginning in verse 35. And the same day, when the eve was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had set away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there were also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat upon the ship, so that it was not full, for it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and said to him, Master, careth not that we perish. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Christ can bring peace to our souls. Even when there is a storm, he is in control. Sometimes, like in the weather, we get a storm. <coughs> My warning came about three weeks ago. Your storm may have arrived without it, but then you may have had it. When a storm comes, what do we do? I think the first thing we do is pray. I know that's what I did. But then later on, we may think, Lord, what are you going to do about this storm I'm in? We realize that we can't do anything about it. And we want the Lord to have it. And then we wonder how long the storm will last. And then after the storm is over, what are the effects going to be? Tornadoes and hurricanes hit, and they only last a few seconds. But the effects can last a lifetime. We just have to look around in our congregation and you can see people who have gone through storms and the effect is lasting a lot. And then I thought, what's our reaction to the storm? In 2 Thessalonians 5, 16, 17, and 18, Paul writes, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I haven't found anywhere, or do I know of anywhere in the scripture where that's an exception. When a storm comes, he doesn't say, okay, you don't have to give thanks. When a storm comes, he doesn't say, you don't have to pray. There are some people who may become bitter and blame God and not want to pray. And then he says to the rejoice always. And we make that glory. And I rejoice in the middle of the storm. If certain things happen, it's not just a storm, it becomes a raging storm. And I want to close with a poem by the Bell. The title of his I will have I will have and heavy I pray. Facing the sun, heart in the shade, as smoke hangs low on the sullen death. I pray until I hear his voice. This is the day that the Lord has made. Rejoice as he lessens the
come from the guy I had the privilege to take the second grade class on the East Side Elementary on a field trip. And one of the teachers that was there went to Wingdeer Park. One of the teachers that was there, she knew I was a Christian. I knew she was a Christian. She went to Valley Forge and she said, uh, Mr. Peter said, I want you to listen to this little girl about her little testimony. So she came over and she told me, she said, tell Mr. Peters about Jesus. And she said, Jesus loves me and he forgives me. And she went on to tell me a little about Jesus and me being the old guy I am. I didn't remember everything she said, but one thing stuck out in my mind. She said, I'm glad that he doesn't have a shark. And it made me think for a minute what that meant. Well, she went on and told her, she, she said, I have encouraged this little girl. She said, my daddy tells me to tell everybody about Jesus. And the teacher said, you know, after she left, she said, you know, this little girl, I can't tell my children about Jesus. But she said, I encourage her every time I can to tell the other children about Jesus. Well, I got to thinking, what did she mean by sharp? I'm glad you don't have a sharpie. I'm about to think, well, wait a minute. A sharpie is a permanent marker. And God's marker is not permanent because if we ask Him to forgive us our sins, He erases them. So I thought, wow, for a little child to tell me that, that I'm glad Jesus don't have a sharpie. It took this old man a while to figure it out. She's pretty smart. That song I'm going to be singing this morning is one of Rodney Griffith's songs that she wrote, he wrote and does a wonderful job writing songs. As a matter of fact, one of the songs he wrote was the pile of crowns that uh, Nathan's been singing so much here lately that I absolutely love. This song is sort of uh, in the line of that song, but when Jesus came to serve, God sent him here, he brought nothing with him. Listen to the words of this song. Crucifying, he 
know the pastor the way in the Bible this morning, and Brother Tom will come speak to us in just a moment. But before he comes, let me tell you about his latest fishing trip. He went to walk on the river to go fishing. And he got to the river and he tried to decide where he might be fishing. He looked across the river on the other side. He saw the perfect spot on the other side of the river. So he looked around. He couldn't find a bridge. He looked around. He couldn't find a boat. And the river was too deep and too uh, cold to wade in. So he didn't worry, how am I going to get out of this? How am I going to get on the other side? So he finally looked up and saw Sherry standing on the other side of the river. And he called him, he said, Sherry! How do I get to the other side? He said, Tom, you are on the other side. <laughs> you can't get me, okay? There is a privilege to have Brother Tom this morning. You bring him up to come to Richard. Amen. Good to be in God's house again this morning. I appreciate the opportunity. Brother Nathan called the other day and he said he wanted me to preach. And I always appreciate the opportunity to preach and read God's Word. And I know, I'm kind of like Nathan. I mentioned something to Sherry about being a little nervous. And I'm not sure I like what she said. She said, you've never died in the pulpit yet. <laughs> that part didn't bother me. It's what she added later. She said, but if you do, it's okay. <laughs> uh, so it's good to be here. And of course, I think about I'm trying to substitute for Nathan. I don't believe there is a substitute for Brother Nathan. But anyhow, I hope it's not like the story I heard about a young boy who was hearing uh, in church that they didn't have their regular pastor. And they said, we have someone that is a substitute for our pastor today. The little boy didn't understand the word substitute. So he leaned over and he asked his mother, he said, Mother, I don't understand. What is a substitute? She said, well, Billy, you remember when you broke the wind of pain uh, with the baseball? And we didn't have a real pain. So we cut a piece of cardboard and we put it in, in place of the real pain and said that that was a substitute. So after the preacher preached, the little boy told his mother, he said, Mother, He's not a substitute, he's a real pain. <laughs> so, that may be the way you feel today. All right. And I, I was a little worried, Brother Floyd, you, you preached half my sermon. So we should get out early today. He's already preached half of it. And I enjoyed that, Brother. Good job. But if you have your Bibles, I'm not using the same uh, portion of Scripture, I mean the same Scripture out of the book that he used in Mark. I'm going to Matthew chapter 8. And I want us to read there, and let's think about what God would have us to know this morning. I know there's something that God wants to say to all of us. I feel that every time that we come together in God's house, that, and we listen to the songs that are sung, the special music, even during the Sunday school hour, there's something there that God wants us to hear. He wants us to be strengthened. He wants us to be encouraged. He wants us to be uplifted. And I know in these last days that we're now living, we need that daily. And we need to encourage one another in these times. And, and that, as we think about what was said, or said by Brother Floyd's uh, prayer and his uh, uh, talk as a deacon, we want to look again in the Scriptures in Matthew chapter 8. And I want to start reading in verse 23. And it's pretty much the same Scripture that he read to us today out of Mark. But it says that when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. You know, I like that part where it says the disciples followed him. You know, we ought to always be following the Lord Jesus Christ. And said, Behold, there arose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said to them, Why are you so why are you fearful? O ye of little faith. Then he arose and rebuked the winds of the sea, and there was a great calm. But the men marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the sea obey him? And for the few minutes that we have together this morning, I'm going to try to share with you a few simple thoughts on what manner of man this man 
Jesus really is. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Fathers, we bow in your presence. We thank you, Lord, for the beautiful day that you've given us. The opportunity that we have to come and fellowship together as a family. And God, to look into thy word and to read and to study. But God, as you look into our individual hearts, you know our needs. And I pray, God, that through thy Holy Spirit this morning, that you might minister to each heart and minister to each need. And God, I ask Christians, may we be drawn closer to you. And God, we, may we be taught in the direction that we ought to go and the things that we ought to do. And we, may we bring glory and honor to your most holy name. And then, Lord, for that one that may be here that's, uh, that's facing a severe storm in their life, whatever it may consist of, God, you can, you can calm that storm. Or you can calm them in the midst of the storm. And I pray, oh God, this morning for that one that may be unsaved. A God that has no one to turn to like Jesus. I pray, God, maybe this morning that, that their eyes might be open to behold who Jesus really is and how much He loves them. And the great sacrifice that He paid for their sins on the cross of Calvary. And God, we pray that today might be the day of their salvation. But well, God, you know our hearts, you know our needs, and we ask, oh God, help us now as we try to preach. And we pray, God, that everything that's said and done here today may it be to lift up and magnify the name of your Son, Jesus, for it's in His name that we pray. Amen. Now, we think about, as we think about that story that Matthew was telling, and then Brother Floyd shared with us out of Mark a moment ago, we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ being with His disciples and they enter into the ship to go across the Sea of Galilee. And as I stated a moment ago, they followed Him into the ship. They did not know what they were facing. They did not know that there would be a tempest to fall the sea and they uh, would be in jeopardy for their lives. But they were there in the ship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and as they were trying to get the ship to the other side, they no doubt had exerted the energy that they had. They uh, knew not what else to do. And we find that they were struggling and they were fearful. And they thought, well, maybe we need to go and talk to Jesus. But Jesus was fast asleep. And as I was reading and thinking about that, I thought, how beautiful a picture of peace with God. That in the midst of the storm, when everybody else was struggling, when everyone else was fearful and thinking their life was in jeopardy, Jesus was fast asleep. And my friend, I want us to understand this morning that even as a child of God, you and I can sleep like a baby in the midst of the storms when we have Jesus on board. And my friend, we find that Jesus was there and they went to Him. And when Jesus got up, His first question was, why is your faith so weak? Why are you so fearful? Because I am with you. You don't need to be afraid. And then the Bible, Jesus said all he had to do was to speak. And the Bible says the winds calmed down and the sea was immediately calm. Now I want to think about this man Jesus as the disciples looked at him. And this was the question that was on their lips. What manner of man is this? That even the winds and the waves obey him. Now, then later, these men, they grew in their faith. They grew in their relationship. And later, when they saw Jesus doing something in the same manner, their statement was not, it was not a question, but a statement said, truly, this, this is the Son of God. But at this occasion in their life, they were fearful and didn't know where to turn. Now, I want to mention about five simple truths about Jesus here this morning. First of all, I want us to understand that He can steal the storm. And many times in our lives, we don't know when the storms are going to come. Regardless of their source, Jesus is always there. Sometimes they originate with Satan himself. Because we know the devil is alive and well on the planet Earth. We know the devil is doing everything he can to distract and try to dishearten and try to discourage and even try to destroy the children of God. But thanks be to the Lord that in the midst of that storm with Satan, 
Jesus is always there. And we serve one that can suppress or subdue Satan. He can give us the victory. And my friend, we need to lean on Him. We need to trust Him daily. We need to commit our lives wholly into Him because He loves us with a love that's beyond our understanding. So sometimes the storms may not originate with Satan. It may be because of financial problems. It may be because of physical problems. It may be because of emotional problems. But whenever the problems come, you can be well assured that the devil will be right there. Because he wants to try to discourage you. He wants to try to tell you that if God really loved you, God wouldn't allow you to go through those things. But then I'm always reminded of Romans chapter 8 verse 28 where Paul was writing and he said all things do work together for good to them that love God, to those who are the called according to His purpose. And my dream, I don't understand the things that come into my life. I don't understand the storms that I've had to go through. I don't understand the storms of the, uh, that other folks are going through. But my dream, I know there's a reason that God does not make any mistakes. And many times, once we've gone through the storm, we come out on the other side with a better Christian character, with a greater and stronger faith in Almighty God. And sometimes God allows it for that reason. And my friend, we need to know that God is there regardless of the source of the storm. And it doesn't make any difference about the force of the storm. It may be a very severe storm in our life. It may be one that is very mild. Or it may be one that makes havoc of our life. But I want to assure you again, God is always there. And I think about what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 12. He said, When thou passest through the water, I will be with thee and through the rivers. They shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned. Neither shall the flame kindle upon you. Now as I read that, and I thought about that verse and the promise of Almighty God. I thought, who in the Scripture can give a witness of that? And then popping into my mind was Daniel, the three Hebrew children. Can you testify to the uh, validity of that statement by God in the book of Isaiah? Yes, we can. Because there in the furnace, the fire didn't kindle upon us. And then Moses and Joshua, no doubt, stand up, let me tell you, about the, the, the rivers and the waters. They'll not overflow you because God, Moses said, let us through the Red Sea. Joshua said, God, let us through the Jordan River on the other side into the land of Canaan. My friend, the same God that Joshua served, the same God that Moses served, the same God is the same God that you and I serve today. And my friend, He was able then, and I want us to understand this morning, He's able now. Amen? There's nothing that's beyond the scope of God's power. My friend, we find that it doesn't make any difference about the storm. There's two things that we need to understand about the storms. First of all, God, we don't go through the storm alone. Because as you read in the book of Hebrews, the Bible tells us there in Hebrews 13, verse 5, Jesus says, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. So when I'm going through trouble, when I'm going through hardship, God's there. And then also in Hebrews 13, 6, The Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what men shall do unto me. So my dear, I want us to understand this morning what manner of man is this Jesus Christ of whom the disciples were speaking. He's one that can, can uh, calm the storms in our life. He can steal the storms. And then secondly, I want us to understand according to the Bible who is this man Jesus He's the one that can save the soul. Amen. As you read in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25, the Bible says, Wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. My friend, thank God for the plan of salvation that was wrought at Calvary 
Thank God for the blood that was shed there. Thank God that blood was sufficient to cleanse and wash away the sins of all the world if they'll come to Him by faith. Aren't you thankful this morning that the blood of Jesus has covered your sins and you can stand before a holy God without the sin stain, without the guilt, because Jesus took our place. He's the man that can, uh, can save our souls. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, that we have been bought with a price. As I was thinking about this word redemption, Looking into the Word of God and study, and I found three separate words that were used for the word being redeemed. And my friend, I believe when we take those three words and put them together and think about what each word means, it gives us a very beautiful picture of God's redemptive plan. First of all, in Revelation chapter 5, the Bible says, And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us, and we underscore that redeemed us, to God by the blood uh, out of every nation, every kindred, every tongue, and people, and nation. Now when we look into the original Greek, that word that's used there for re redeem is agor abzo. And what it means here, it means to buy in the marketplace. It means to purchase like off the slate block. And my friend, that's where you and I were. We were on the slate block of sin. You and I were slaves to Satan. We were slaves to sin. We were slaves to our sale. But my friend, God loved us enough that He purchased us by His own blood. So we were bought in the marketplace. We were taken off the slate block. And then again, another word for redeem we find in Galatians chapter 4 verse 5 where Paul said to redeem them that are under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. And this is another Greek word that means that the Greek word is uh, ex agor adzo. And what it means is to take off the market or to buy something for oneself and reserve it for your own use. I agree. That's what God did for us through Jesus Christ. He bought us off the slave block. He took us out of the marketplace. We're not sale for sale anymore. God wants to use us for His own purposes. And I agree. That's the reason we ought to give ourselves completely and fully to God and give our lives to Him in a way that we glorify and honor Him. He set us apart. So He took us off the slave block. He bought us for Himself. And I believe Paul talked about in the book of Ephesians that He has given us the earnest of the Holy Spirit. He's put the stamp of the Holy Spirit on us. And in His love, He says, That one belongs to me, devil. My friend, as we think about that this morning, how many of us belong to God? How many of us have the earnest of the Holy Spirit? How many of us know that we have Jesus on board? How many of us know that Jesus Christ has saved our soul? I hope and pray that everyone will be able to say, yes, I know I've passed from death into life. I know I'm saved. I know that I'd go to heaven if I die right now. I know if Jesus came back. I do have it right now. I hope you have that assurance. But then, very quickly, one other word about uh, in redeem, and we find First Peter chapter one verse eighteen says, "For as much as you know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers." So here we have the word redeemed again, but it's another Greek word, and it's a Greek word uh, luthrolo. Lutrobo, which means to release after the payment of the ransom. So what this man, he was a man that was on the slave block. He was a man that was purchased. And then once he was purchased, he was let free. You know, the Bible says that ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. My friend, we have liberty in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are free from the world of sin and sorrow. We're free from the guilt of, uh, of pain. We don't have to even worry about death because Jesus took care of that for us also. So my dream, He has redeemed us, taken us off the slave block, bought us for Himself, and He set us free. The shackles have fallen off. 
We're free. Thank God for that. So not only do we say this morning that Jesus, this man that was seen on that boat that day, that calmed the sea, he can steal the storm. He can save the soul. But thirdly, he can satisfy the saint. Because as you read in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 25, Jeremiah wrote, he says, For I have uh, satiated the weary soul, and I have replenished every sorrowful soul. Now, that word satiate, I looked up in Webster's Dictionary just to see what it meant, and here's what he said. He said to gratify with more than enough. That's our Jesus. Amen. Amen. To gratify with more than enough. And then I looked at another definition. He had said everything is, uh, or everything he gives us is to satisfy us to the full. And I thought about it as I read that definition. I talk about what the Bible says that we have in Jesus Christ. We have more abundant life. Amen. You know, we don't know life until we know Jesus. We don't know peace until we know Jesus. We don't know happiness until we know Jesus. So it's Jesus that has filled us and satisfied us. And my dream, not only is that satisfaction something that is in, internal, that He gives us, we have the peace of Almighty God, but I believe it's something that's external. Because the world, the things of the world, doesn't appeal to us anymore. Because we have a tugging from the other side. Jack, from the other side. We have a tugging from the other side. God is on the other side. And, and the beauties of heaven and all the Bible talks about, well, other ones are there. Family, dreams of going on the floor. And there's a tugging on our hearts. We want to go. And we want to be there. This world has lost its appeal. But one day, thank God, that blessed happiness that the Lord Jesus Christ has given us, which is internal and external, will one day be eternal. Amen? Amen. Because when we get to heaven, we don't know satisfaction here until we get to heaven. But my friend, we'll see and experience things like Paul said, I have not seen, here, have not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for him. But one day we shall see those. But the only way is through and by the Lord Jesus Christ. So my friend, this morning, can you say that Jesus is on board? He is with me through the storms. Jesus is with me. He saved my soul. Jesus is with me. He satisfies me in this old world. And my friend, more so when I get to heaven. And then as we move on, not only do we say that He steals the storm and He saves the soul and satisfies the saints, but He knows how to shepherd the sheep. Uh, David talked about that in the 23rd Psalm. He talks about the fact that He feeds us. I thank God for His precious Word that feeds us and keeps us spiritually nourished every day. Amen. He leads us to the pastors and He feeds us. And thank God for that. He leads us where we need to go. And I think about what Job said in Job chapter 23 and verse 12 concerning the feeding of God as He feeds us upon His precious Word of truth that nourishes our spiritual souls. He said... I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said, I, I'd rather have God's word than I would to sit down at a bountiful table to eat physically. And my friend, that's how much God's word needs to mean to us. That word of God that nourishes us and helps us through this life. Then I think about what Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 2. He said, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that ye may grow thereby. And my friend, we need the Word of God, and it's Jesus that feeds us. And not only does David say He feeds us, and He takes us to the green pastures, but He leads us. And He leads us in the right path. And my friend, when we're following Jesus, we won't go astray. Amen. <laughs> he relieves us with the right peace. We have the presence of of the shepherd, just like the disciples had him in the boat on the Sea of Galilee when the storm came up. Jesus is walking with us daily. He is our good shepherd. And he leads us with the right protection and with the right provisions. 
and he leads us to the right place. And my friend, as we think about this man Jesus, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? He's the man that can calm our storms. He's the one that can save our soul, and I hope every one of them says he has. He's the one that can satisfy our needs in this life and above that for all eternity. And he's the one that shepherds us as his sheep. And then one last thing that I want to mention as we come to a close, that he can any time summons the saved. I like that. Amen. I thank God that He's calmed many a storm for me. Amen. Or calmed me during many a storm. Amen. I thank God that He saved my soul. Amen. I thank God that He's given me everything that I've ever needed. I didn't say He gave me everything I wanted because sometimes I want too much. But He's given me everything I need. And I'm looking forward to that time that I'll receive more abundant that which He promised in heaven. You know, He promised me a new body. And I'm looking forward to that. I'll race across heaven when we get there, Jack. Amen. And my friend, He promised me a new home. Amen. And He promised me life for all eternity. No more sickness. The Bible says God shall wipe away all of our tears. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more sickness. No more pain. No more heartache. Because all these former things will have passed away. Amen. But as I think about that last point, He can any time summons the saved. I want to mention some things very quickly with this. First of all, Jesus decreed it. He said in John chapter 14, verse 3, He said, If I go away and prepare a place for you, I will come again. That's the promise of Jesus. He I am on the way, but I'm coming back. And receive you unto myself, that where I am, ye may be also. And then I thought about Jesus decreed it. Then I read on a little further, and the Bible says the angels declared it. Because the disciples watched him go away into heaven with broken and heavy hearts. There were two angels standing there in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 11. And said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye here gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus that you see going away from you shall come in like manner as you see him go away. Jesus decreed it, the angels declared it. Paul described it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, our Sunday school lesson a few weeks back is on this. It says, For the Lord himself shall ascend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. And of course it goes on to say, Did we which are alive and remain shall be called up to meet the Lord in the air? And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Yes, Jesus decreed it, the angels declared it, and Paul described it. But then I read a little bit more. And it says the scoffers disputed. Because in Peter, as Peter was writing chapter 3 of 2 Peter verse 4, he says, there were those who would come and say, we're in the promise of His coming. For all things continue as they were since the fathers fell asleep. My friends, so they have. But that doesn't take away the fact that Jesus is coming back. Amen. We have scoffers. Peter had scoffers in his day. We have scoffers in our day. They don't believe it. They set it aside. They disregard it. But Jesus is still coming. Whether we believe it or not, Jesus is coming. Amen. So Jesus dec decreed it. The angel declared it. Paul described it. The scoffers deputed, disputed it. And the same delighted it. I don't know, I like what Luke said in chapter 21, verse 27. He was talking about the end time. He was talking about the days of trouble, the days of heartache, talking about when men's hearts shall start uh, failing them because of fear. My friend, I believe we're living in those days. But then Luke went on to say this. He says, And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. Lift up your head, your redemption draw nigh. 
Jesus decreed it, the angel declared it, Paul described it, the scoffers disputed it, the saved delight in it, and then I read something else. The troubled desire. Paul was writing to the church of Thessalonica, was under some severe persecution, and he talked about the things that were coming and the fact that tribulation was coming upon those and those that were unsaved would be recompensed for their evil doings. But he went on to say it, to the, the, the Thessalonian believers, he said this, And to you who are troubled, and this is a verse for us today too, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven, with his mighty, mighty angels. He's coming again. And then, last, the unbelievers disregarded. First chapter of Revelation, verse 7. It says, Behold, he cometh with the clouds. That's what the angels said. And he does. John speaks of it here in the book of Revelation. He cometh with the clouds, and every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. And there will be those that disregard the teaching. There will be those that will disregard the truths that are presented from the pulpit across America and around the world from the word of God that this man Jesus who steals our storm, who saves our souls, who will satisfy our every need, he will shepherd his sheep. He will someday summons his children. But my friend, are you ready? And I want to ask as we come to a close, is Jesus on board with you? You need Him. If you don't need Him now, you will. So my friend, today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow night, not next week, but today. And my friend, if you've not been saved, the Bible tells us there's only two destinies for the soul of man regardless of what the world teaches. The Bible says there's either heaven or hell. Heaven's for those who have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Those who have been saved. Those who disregard it. Those who ignore it. Those who turn their ear. There's a place called hell that we don't want anyone to go to. My friend, I hope that you people say this morning, yes, I'm saved. My friend, he wants to satisfy you in this life. You know, I like what Paul said on one occasion. He said, I found in whatever state I am in to be content. And it doesn't make a difference what Paul faced. He was content in Christ. He was happy in the Lord. His if he went by his circumstances, he would have been full of woe and sorrow. But he didn't let the circumstances get the upper hand. He held on to the hand of Jesus. And he was happy in his spiritual life. And one day Jesus is coming. Now that we bow our heads and our eyes are closed and we prepare to have him in the picture of him. I want you to seriously. Look in your heart. And I want you to think about your relationship with Christ. It may be the day that you're going through a storm. And you might just want to bring that to Jesus. He loves you. And He wants to help you. And you, you may be here today and you, you've really never been saved. And I want to tell you this morning, He wants to save you. My friend, maybe you, you just uh, live in a life of dissatisfaction. Our Jesus can satisfy you. So my dream, if there's a need spiritually in your life, I want to ask you this morning to turn it over to Him. Let's stand together as we have our heads bowed for prayer. And then we're going to sing. If there's a need in your heart, if there's a need in your life, I invite you to bring that need not to the church, not to me, but I want you to bring that need to Jesus. And here all men the need just laid out before Him. He loves you. He knows the need even before you bring it. And not only that, He's able to. Our Heavenly Fathers, we bow in Your presence. We thank You, Lord, for the blessings of this day. Thank You for Your great truth. And Lord, I pray that maybe something was said today in some way that would encourage the hearts of Your children. And Lord, should there be someone here today that's unsaved, maybe something the Holy Spirit could use to get their parts. But God, as You look upon these hearts this morning, You know the need. And I pray, God, may the Holy Spirit Continue to move and to speak as we sing. And God give us souls around the altar that you'll suffer. And what you do, God will give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.